to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. And actually, we have a really interesting thematic uh, presentations uh, today, which is two of our uh, faculty who are focused on imaging technologies in a way that I think is going to provide important insights into not only neuroscience, but most specifically in brain tumors. And obviously for a disease like that, novel imaging studies, I think are critical for uh, true human in vivo research. So um, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Jason Kai is an assistant professor of radiology and biomedical Im imaging. Um, uh, Jason did his uh, postdoctoral work at the University of Pittsburgh and then ultimately recruited to Yale uh, to be an assistant professor. And his research group is focused on uh, developing novel approaches of PET imaging for uh, drug development, as well as the investigation of uh, neurologic disorders and brain tumors. Uh, Jason received the Burson Yalo Award uh, for his original work in nuclear medicine, um, and also the Archer Foundation Research Award, which, forced, which advances his novel research in neuroscience. And, and Jason, uh, welcome and looking forward to your hearing about your work in uh, brain tumor imaging. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for the kind of introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So here we go. All right. Are you looking at the right screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm very excited to be here to talk about our research in the context of uh, cancer imaging. So our lab, you know, spend a lot of time working on neuroimaging and cancer imaging. So uh, neuro-oncology is a relatively cross-talk between these two fields. So I'll be uh, introduced, introducing PET imaging very quickly, a little bit of uh, a brain tumor. I believe Renee is going to uh, talk about that like in more details in the next talk. And Next, I will talk about some, some of the radiopharmaceuticals or PET users uh, that are commonly used in clinical research or clinical management of brain tumors using PET. And last, I will talk about some of the new targets for brain tumor imaging, uh, which are you know, specifically interested in us, for us you know, as a research lab. So first, glioblastoma is a fatal disease with less than 10% of patients surviving five years after initial diagnosis and treatment. And 15% of all brain tumors and half of the, all gliomas is glioblastoma. Uh, there's still no early detection method available. So uh, you know, people in this field are uh, calling for new and better imaging methods to manage this uh, disease. So PET imaging, uh, in a nutshell, composed uh, four components. The first, we need to have a PET scanner uh, to detect all the uh, PET signals. And second, we need to have a PET tracer or PET radio pharmaceuticals. We call it PET tracer because uh, we're administering a very small amount of radio pharmaceuticals, the trace amount. And also because those molecules tend to be tracing a biological process or receptor, protein, and then, so it's patricer for, for ease. And next we need to have quantification methods, mathematic models to generate physiological parameters on these PET imaging studies. And the last and most important component is the clinical impact. So this is up to nuclear physicians to how to use these uh, tools combination of the scanner, PET tracer, and quantification measures to make an impact in patient and disease management. So we just published a mini review on the current radio pharmaceuticals or PET tracers in brain tumor uh, this year. So this talk is uh, mainly around this uh, same from this uh, review. So first, the most classic patricer used for brain tumor is obviously a, a glucose analog called FDG, fluorodeoxy glucose. And the first application of FDGs ha happened to be in brain tumor. 
uh, that's back in 1982, uh, it's reported, uh, several case reports actually. Uh, as you can see from the image here, the first is, and the second are C contrast enhanced CT images. And you can see the, uh, the brain tumor mass uh, indicated by enhanced mass by this contrast CT. And also from the PET, you actually see a hypometabolism. Uh, because this happened to be a low-grade brain tumors. And later, FDG, FDG approved FDG in 1997. And as you can see, at the earliest time, the PET scanner has very low spatial resolution. It's about 1.7 centimeter resolution. And now we have dedicated brain PET scanners up with up to 1 or 2 millimeters spatial resolution. So FDG as you see, it has a high background in the brain because the uh, brain uses sugar as its a uh, major metabolism or energy source. Uh, you can see from the gray matter, the high uptake. Uh, well, a lower, but FDG is still useful for grading gliomas because for low grade or benign gliomas, you see a hypometabolism. You, you have lower FDG uptake in the brain region, in the brain tumor region, relative to the gray matter. Well, at, at higher grade gliomas, you have a higher uptake for FDG, which is higher than gray matter and white, and white matter. Uh, with a glioblastoma, you, you can you have even higher FDG uptake. And also you can you can see uh, there's necrosis core in, in, the, in the center of the tumor. So based on paper published in 1995, uh, there's a cutoff level for differentiating low grade uh, from high grade glioma, which is 1.5 for tumor to white matter and 0.6 for tumor to cortex ratio. And nowadays, because of the, uh, the fusion of uh, PET with anatomical radiological imaging methods, such as a CT and MR, uh, actually you can use a contrast enhanced anatomical modalities to define the region of interest for the tumor uh, to better quantify uh, the FDG uptake. So uh, because of the high background of sugar analogs, so people in this field have been calling for a uh, PET imaging agents with lower burn uptake uh, than FDG. So that turned out to be uh, amino acids. So amino acids analogs tend to have lower uptake in healthy brain tissues, while higher uptake in tumors because tumor cells overexpress amino L-type amino acid transporters. So the most advanced I would see uh, arguably uh, is a uh, mycelonin, the carbon-11 labeled mycelonin. Um, so this is essential amino acids that's evidently uptaken by tumor cells while it's brain uptake in healthy tissues or cells are limited. So it's useful in the clinic, clinic to distinguish a tumor progression from uh, radio necrosis. For example, in this, uh, in this case, from the anatomical images, it's, it's pretty hard to distinguish uh, these two cases. But uh, from mycelonin, it's uh, also called MAT. From MAT pad, you can easily tell the top case is a tumor progression, while the bottom case is actually a uh, radio necrosis. So besides amino acid PET, there's also uh, imaging agents derived from nucleosides because nucleosides are used for DNA synthesis. And uh, it's uptaken into the tumor cells through, uh, for example, this is a, uh, Fluorosamidin, uh, F18 labeled fluorosamidin is a nucleoside uptaken into cells by samidin kinase 1. And the samidin kinase 1 is overexpressed uh, during the, the, in the tumor cell because it's involved in the DNA synthesis. And nucleosides are involved in general in cellular proliferation and uh, they can correlate and histological grade of brain tumors and its accumulation co also correlates with the activity of thymidine kinase 1. And it's a, 
ideal tracer for imaging tumor proliferation. Uh, but, also, but also because FLT is not actually is not brain penetrant, it doesn't cross a blood brain barrier. So in order to have any signal uptake, uh, the tumor's BBB needs to be compromised. So it's not suitable for lower grade uh, glioma imaging. But nevertheless, it, it, it has its role in the uh, tumor imaging pad. And so from this case, you can see the contrast, gadolinium contrast enhanced IMR images, uh, which can clearly delineate the tumor regions. And uh, you can see the uh, hypermetabolism, sugar metabolism in the center of the uh, tumor, and also mycelin uptake in a larger area. Well, from FLT pad, you can actually see not only the tumor, but also the infiltration of the tumor uh, to the burn region. So besides mycelin, MET, uh, there are other amino acid analogs uh, being used in burn tumor PET. Uh, for example, uh, tyrosine and uh, floral dopa, F-dopa. F-dopa is actually approved by FDA uh, to image Parkinsonian syndrome back in 2019 uh, because F-dopa reflects uh, is accumulated in dopaminergic neurons and dopaminergic neurons are damaged uh, in Parkinson's disease. But, but there are also a lot of efforts in uh, applying F-DOPA in brain tumor imaging because F-DOPA is also transported into brain tumor cells through L-type amino acid transporters. And once it's inside the cells, it's metabolized into DOPA and it's trapped in the cell. Uh, a recent, a relatively recent patricer for uh, amino acid imaging is a uh, fluoride chlorine. This is, this tracer is approved by FDA in 2016 for imaging recurrent prostate cancer, but there is still great effort in applying this tracer in uh, glioblastoma imaging. And actually, the uh, tumor uptake of F18 fluoride chlorine in correlated well with uh, brain tumor imaging through MET, mycelin. Um, and it's actually useful when the MR, you know, contrast enhanced MR is non-diagnostic, uh, but still based on the, the preliminary data we have in the, for the clinical studies, uh, we can't tell whether the uptake of flu cyclobrin is solely due to the recurrent tumor or perhaps some of the signals contributed uh, from inflammation and other processes. So further studies uh, is needed to establish the role of this tracer in the management of brain tumor in the clinic. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce some of the emerging imaging targets for brain tumor. So I, my interest in brain tumor imaging actually is uh, originated from this part X, uh, uh, sigma one receptor imaging. So we're, we were initially interested in using uh, sigma one receptor PET uh, to study neurodegenerative disorders. And, and in one summer, there was a visiting a student uh, from Germany and he brought in a product to use sigma one receptor developed in their lab to image uh, brain tumor. So to evaluate their imaging probe, so we collaborate with Jiang Bin's lab. So this is Gong Dong from his lab, uh, generated U87, a look, which is a glioblastoma tumor cell line expresses a luciferase. Uh, so we use bioluminescence to monitor the tumor growth over three weeks. After the tumor reaches a, a you know, the certain size, we uh, scan them by uh, using PET, small animal PET, PET CT. And we use two PET tracers, and they are enantiomers. Uh, from the PET images, uh, we can tell the tumor uptake is significantly higher than the rest of the brain, while the tumor uptake uh, decreases uh, over time, eventually uh, getting lower than the uh, healthy brain tissue for each uh, uh, enantiomers. And from the T2 MRI, we can clearly visualize the tumor. 
so we can analyze the uh, region of interest for the tumor uptake. So this tells us the sigma one receptor expression in healthy brain is also significant, which may similarly to FDG path, you know, complicates the PET imaging data analysis. So this is also confirmed by doing non-human primate PET imaging. So sigma one receptor PET users are uptaking in healthy brain regions significantly over time. So the question now is to uh, identify a biomarker for glioblastoma with low expression in healthy brain tissues. So that turned out to uh, PARP. PARP is a poly-ADP uh, ribose polymerase. PARP1 is a DNA repair enzyme. It's overexpressed in glioblastoma with overall low expression in healthy brain tissue. So in that sense, it, it might be an ideal imaging agent for glioblastoma imaging. And the PARP's function is uh, to recognize DNA damage and uh, recruit proteins to repair the uh, single strand or even double strands of DNA damage. There are multiple active clinical trials going on actually targeting PARP as a therapeutic target in glioblastoma. So a PET imaging agent targeting PARP could be also helpful in facilitating uh, the drug development or stratify patients for PARP targeted imaging uh, therapeutics. To evaluate uh, any imaging agents before we do a clinical imaging study, we need to evaluate those imaging probes using animal models. So this is work done by Carney and colleagues. Uh, it's published in 2018. They actually surveyed PARP1 expression over a panel of human PDX, small cell lung cancer PDX, and together with healthy uh, tissues from the rodents. As you can see, the PARP is generally positive and highly expressed in these PDX tissues, as well as in spleen of the animal, while its expression in brain tissue is relatively low. So further, they injected a, a Olaparib derived PARP imaging PET agents into these PDX models. They were able to uh, identify the tumor uptake over time and compare it with the muscle as a reference region. Normally, muscle has, because muscle has very low uptake of the tracer, indicating it's low PARP expression in muscle. And the PARP imaging agents showed quick uptake into the tumor, and which is uh, which is slowly uh, decreased over time. And the muscle, tumor to muscle region reaches uh, the highest level at two hours post tracer injection. So by using PET imaging, uh, they were able to uh, study the pharmacokinetics of uh, the olaparib derivative. Uh, at the, about the same time, back in 2018, another group at UPAN uh, studies another uh, PARP PET imaging agents, which is derived uh, uh, from a different scaffold. They name it F18 FTT. So they, they did first in human study in, um, they recruited 20 patients and scanned them at the baseline and uh, the patients underwent the surgery, so they were able to collect the tissues to correlate the PET imaging results with the uh, immunohistal uh, fluorescence results, as well as autoradiography study. So in this study, they actually showed uh, a panel of PARP-specific uptake in the tumor by PET, as well as uh, immunofluorescence, and there's strong correlation between PET SUV values and the fluorescence results, as well as between autoradiography signal and the fluorescence signal. But uh, the PARP expression level doesn't correlate with FDG PET. So FDG cannot be used in place of PARP imaging. So about uh, earlier this year, there's, uh, they expanded their clinical trials of PARP PET into uh, breast cancer patients. However, all of the PARP imaging agents 
we have uh, currently a do not penetrate intact blood-brain barrier. So that limits its application in brain tumor. And this is confirmed by their non-human primate PET brain imaging study. So we uh, took a look at the pharmacokinetic information of the current uh, PARP inhibitors and decided to pursue valiparate based uh, scar fold for PET imaging, hopefully to identify a burn penetrant PET imaging agents for PARP. So in that direction, so we have identified and synthesized a, a lead PARP imaging agents derived from valiparib and did a pilot study in collaboration with Hank from MRRC. Uh, using their RG2 rat model, burn tumor model, we were able to uh, uh, image the RG2 tumor. Uh, here, the baseline scans using the PARP PET imaging agents. And for this one, we pre-injected the, the animal with uh, code valiparib, which is uh, also a part specific molecule that can com compete with a PET tracer to displace a tracer uptake in the tumor. So after a uh, semi-quantitative analysis, we can tell from the uh, average SUV values from 30 to 60 minutes uh, post tracer administration, uh, the tumor uptake is about one. After the blocking drug, the tumor uptake was decreased to about 0 0.5, indicating uh, the new PARP PET imaging tracer actually really target PARP in vivo as they bind to the same target as the valiparate, the blocking drug. Uh, at the same time, we look at the control lateral, uh, which is presumably to be the healthy brain tissue, and it showed relatively lower uptake than the tumor, and the blocking doesn't have significant effect over there. So here's the tumor to control lateral ratio. And at baseline, uh, it's about 2.5. After blocking, it drops to about 1.5, indicating about 46% blockade uh, from the valiparib. And to validate uh, the PET imaging data, we perform pilot biodistribution study. Uh, we look at the tracer distribution of, among the uh, different, uh, different uh, tissues of the animal. And not surprisingly, uh, the tracer has high spleen uptake because spleen is another large organ uh, that's part positive. Uh, because also, it's uh, blocked by the valiparate. And consistent with the PET imaging data, we see high uptake in the tumor and it's blocked by the valiparib as well. Uh, further analysis of this pilot data uh, indicates uh, a very high you know, spleen to blood ratio and also very high tumor to blood ratio for the power positive regions. And it also shows some extent of the brain uptake which is uh, seem to be blocked by the cold drug. So further study, confirmative study needs to be done to see if, if this tracer actually goes into the uh, intact brain or not. Okay, so next product, the next imaging target I'd like to introduce is PDL1. I think for this target, this is probably the target that doesn't need much introduction. Um, PDL1. So we do have PDL1 targeted PET imaging tracers in this field. Uh, Dave Donnelly published a paper in 2017 uh, about their uh, protein-based PDL1 PET tracer. They, they name it BMS 96182. So they use a simple xenograft with a PDL1 positive tumor on one side and a PDL1 negative tumor on the other side. So they did a baseline scan without blocking agents, and they did a blocking scan. As you can see, after blocking agents, uh, the tracer uptake was diminished to the same level of the uh, non-specific uptake, to the same level of the pdl one negative tumor uptake, while the baseline scan showed higher uptake. So they also did autoradiography. This is in vitro autoradiography study. And they not, they not only look at these two xenograft uh, cell lines, they also look at some, some human tissues and they saw like higher PDL1 
expression in those human tumor tissues. So with that data, they translated their imaging probes to a first in human study. They, they chose non-small cell lung cancer as their uh, first uh, patient population. Uh, in that study published in 2018, they actually compared FDG PET with uh, PDL1 PET and another uh, the conium 189 labeled uh, involublumib at the PD1 PET. So those three imaging modalities can all detect the, uh, the, the non-small cell lung cancer nodule, but with a heterogeneous uh, imaging patterns, indicating those three modalities are actually complementary uh, to each other. They provide different information on the tumor metabolism and, and PD-L1 expression as well as PD-1 expression. Uh, also, they show one case where there's a tumor metastasis uh, because the tumor metastasis uh, it could be the uh, low PDL1 expression over there, or it could be the uh, the more intact uh, blood burn barrier. So, in order to apply PDL1 PET imaging in in tumor imaging or glioma, glioma PET, we uh, initiated a product to develop a brain penetrant PDL1 PET imaging agents based on small molecules. So, this product is at an early stage. I don't have animal data to uh, share with you. So I'm gonna just uh, say very briefly uh, the, the process for discovery and development of radio pharmaceuticals or PET research. So if you look at this process, it's actually very similar to the R&D process of a therapeutic drug. You need to identify a target, uh, clinically relevant biomarkers, and you need to do MedCam to develop small molecules or micromolecules. Uh, specifically binding to the target uh, after in vitro assay and in vivo assays using PET and bio distribution. Uh, you can move on to the toxicity and the dose symmetry study and the file and END application. After doing clinical trial, cl initial validations and clinical trials, uh, finally reach to FDA approval. So uh, I'd like to use uh, uh, the last few minutes to uh, update you the latest advancement in the PET scanner because PET scanner is a critical component in the PET imaging research. Uh, so very excitingly, recently we saw a prototype for total body PET. So traditionally the PET scanner, uh, we need to move the bed to get the whole body PET imaging study done. But with a total body PET, uh, we can collect all the em emission uh, signals from the patients so that means a significantly increase uh, some detection sensitivity, and we, we, which allows much lower dose for, uh, for the patient. So supposedly we can reduce the, uh, the, uh, the radio pharmaceutical injection, the dose by 40 fold. Uh, this means the whole body PET scan will, will cause 0 0.15 millisafe uh, dosimetry. Uh, well, the natural uh, background uh, every year is 2.4 millisieve, and the round trip, international round trip, is about 1.11 uh, millisieve. This means the whole body PET can reduce the dosimetry to almost equivalent to a round trip international flight. And also, with the whole body PET scanner system, we can study the uh, diseases at the systemic level. So, looking at the cancer uh, throughout the body. So in summary, uh, so PET imaging and uh, potentially uh, application in glioblastoma is to demonstrate the phenotype and disease severity correlations. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to discover new therapeutic targets based on more uh, imaging, clinical imaging studies. And it's also very helpful in the drug development process in demonstrating the penetration and pharmacokinetics of the experimental drug in effect compartment. Uh, it can be used to quantitate pharmacodynamics by doing receptor occupancy study to maximize the, uh, the dose range to be used in uh, efficacy clinical trials. And also how could be useful for patient stratification and to evaluate therapeutic effects and in the clinic uh, PET can be used for diagnosis or prognosis. 
uh, as well as tracking disease progression. Uh, finally, achieve uh, precision medicine. So at last, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my group uh, and the staff, faculty, and students at the EO Pet Center, our internal and external collaborators, and our funding agents for supporting our uh, research. And this is a picture uh, we took last year, and this is what we look uh, this year. Well, Jason, thank you. Uh, it was a really terrific review of uh, you know novel approaches to imaging, both for clinical care and research. And yeah, thank you for uh, changing the context of your research group uh, photo in terms of the current world. You know, Jason, we're um, why don't we um, why don't I suggest that for folks who have questions for you to direct them to you uh, offline, just because we're uh, at the we're a little late in the time, and I want to make sure there's time for, for Zach. But uh, Jason, thank you for a super, superb presentation. Again, I invite people to submit, send questions to Jason to his email. Um, but let me now turn to our, our second speaker, uh, the Dr. Zachary Corbin. Zach, um, as many of you know, is an assistant professor of neurology. He received his medical degree at Yale uh, and thereafter uh, did his uh, residency training at the University of California at San Francisco, ultimately being recruited back here uh, to join the faculty in neurology and neuro-oncology. Uh, Zach's interest beyond uh, CNS malignancies uh, has been in research, most notably in understanding the biology of brain tumors through uh, novel approaches to imaging and particularly the metabolic changes that occur in these tumors. So Zach, uh, thank you for agreeing to present and really interested, really excited to hear about your work. And, and Jason, if you could stop uh, sharing your screen. Oh, sure. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. Let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. Dr. Fuchs, thank you so much for the introduction. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. And thank you very much, Jason. And thank you for the introduction, or thank you for the invitation. So I'm one of the neuro-oncologists at SMILO, and it's my privilege today to talk about uh, in vivo metabolic imaging of primary brain tumors. And what a great segue or transition uh, to move on. I'm gonna start really by giving some background, clinical background on glioma, um, clinical treatments and limitations of glioma, and specifically glioblastoma, as was introduced. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about pseudoprogression, which is something that Jason, Jason mentioned, and also has been discussed in this venue by Dr. Chang with metastatic disease in the brain. I'm going to talk about metabolism in cancer and the Warburg effect in particular as a prominent metabolic change that we could potentially image and transition to methods, results, and our current investigations, things we can show you now and things we're very excited about showing you soon. In particular, I'm gonna to talk to you about something that we call the Warburg Index, which we created here at Yale. And then future directions and things we're looking forward to sharing with everyone in the future. So to move forward and talk about some background, I think that uh, glioma has a profound impact. It's a relatively rare disease, but the public burden is substantial. And I, I, when thinking about the disease, I like to think about important public events that have happened recently. So this is uh, Ted Kennedy, President Kennedy's brother, who died of glioblastoma as Senator of Massachusetts in 2009. And this is Bo Biden, Vice President Joe Biden's son. So he was previously Attorney General of Delaware, but he did die of what is known as an aggressive primary brain tumor while his father was Vice President of our country. And this is John McCain, who died of a glioblastoma as Senator from Arizona. And so, you know, that is a good introduction to what is 
A disease that has an annual incidence in the U.S. of 20,000 is, is glioma in general. And glioblastoma in particular has an annual incidence of 11,000, actually almost 12,000, over 11,000. It's the most common primary malignant brain tumor, as Dr. Kai already mentioned. And it's five-year relative survival. It has increased recently. I'm an optimist. So this is an improvement at 6.8% in five years. Only a few years ago, we were discussing numbers in 5%. And so uh, we're moving forward. But we have a lot of movement to do. Glioblastoma is a profound disease frequently at presentation. This is a case that I cared for when I was a fellow at Stanford. And this is a relatively common scan we see. Here you have MRI, gadolinium enhanced T1 sequence where you can see boundaries of blood brain barrier breakdown of the primary tumor. This is flare processed T2 sequence axial projection of the MRI, where you can see some changes surrounding the tumor. This is a substantial tumor with lots of mass effect. You can see shifting of the normal brain. This patient had relatively mild symptoms. If I recall, he had visual field changes and he had a neglect syndrome, but actually really presented mostly because his family brought him in. And that is true. This is a sudden and dramatic disease, but can actually be relatively subtle as well to some patients, which is remarkable. And I like to show this slide for three reasons, really. So despite what is really an absolutely remarkable, as it's a privilege to talk here, uh, research and clinical endeavor to improve care for this category of diseases, we still have a standard of care in glioblastoma from 2005. This is the Stoop paper also called the Stoop Protocol from 2005. And it demonstrated that patients with glioblastoma have improved outcomes when they are treated with radiotherapy. It's really chemo radiation, radiotherapy plus temidar at the same time, followed by, excuse me, temozolomide after radiation. And they have improved outcomes compared to radiation alone. But as I said, I'd like to show a few things here. So we have a great deal of patients who have died and very quickly. And this is relatively noisy out here, but we still have a number of patients to measure the effect. So you can see that there's a lot of room to grow, as I've mentioned. But in addition, you can see something else that's interesting, which is that there are a number of patients that survive and a long time, years. And it's very difficult to predict, as Dr. Kai mentioned, at the start, who is going to come from here and still live? We don't have prognostic or diagnostic ways of determining this. So in order to discuss another related but somewhat complementary fact of care for brain tumors currently is the delayed results of other clinical trials in patients who have tumors that are less aggressive than glioblastoma. So these are the results of the RTOG 9402 clinical trial that really targeted a moderate severity brain tumor, an anaplastic oligodendroglioma and oligoastrocytoma, although oligoastrocytoma is a relatively antiquated term. And this protocol enrolled patients, and similarly to the Stoop protocol, patients received either chemotherapy, this time with PCV chemotherapy with radiation or radiation alone. And you can see approximately 10 years in 2006, approximately 10 years after the study was started, there was no indication as to which was superior. 10 years later, almost 20 years after the study began, you can actually see a signal. And by this analysis, it demonstrated that patients do better with PCV with radiotherapy as compared to radiotherapy alone. So we have uh, two processes going on where you have a substantial burden of a very aggressive disease and difficult to predict long-term survivors in that disease. And in less aggressive tumors, we have prolonged 20 years potentially wait between when we institute a standard of care or, or when we are trying to define the standard of care and when we have results that help us with that standard of care. So this is really good fodder for exactly what the context today is for other ways, biomarkers of measuring this disease. 
So I want to switch gears for a second and also discuss pseudo progression specifically. This is another case that was brought up to me when I was a fellow at Stanford. This patient had a glioblastoma. He underwent treatment. And then this is very similar uh, pictures as I've shown you before. So gadolinium enhanced MRI and flare T2 MRI. And you can see tumor here. So the patient actually had growth of the lesion and it was raised whether this lesion was a true tumor progression or whether it was pseudo progression. Pseudo progression, largely necrosis, but really a response probably by the tumor and also the brain to treatment that we give the patient. And so standard of care studies include FDG-PET, which we've heard a lot about in the study. And you can see the background, as was mentioned, is quite bright. This is all normal brain. But in the area of this tumor, you can see that there was uptake. And so this is hypermetabolic. It was felt that favored tumor. And so this patient went to surgery. Unfortunately, surgery showed that this patient had necrosis, which is pseudoprogression. So it's very challenging to deal with pseudoprogression in primary brain tumors, especially in the setting of the need to have a large surgery to confirm. So one of the potential areas to expand our knowledge is imaging. And really, imaging has moved forward with the overall understanding of cancer, which has been maybe 100 years ago in anatomical disease, tumors, balls that are growing, to physiologic disease, tumors that acquire blood vessels and other changes as they grow and become more aggressive to really what is a metabolic disease where there are fundamental likely metabolic changes that might be the nidus of cancer and certainly are associated with aggressive disease. Imaging has really moved forward with our understanding anatomical. So first we were able to, just as we showed here, see the tumor ball. Then we learn much more about the tumor by things like perfusion imaging, which can tell us a great deal about the heterogeneity, especially of aggressive primary brain tumors. And metabolic imaging now has become at the forefront where we might be able to do many things. Potentially, I'll show you, do some prognosis and diagnosis, but in addition, potentially treatment effect measurements. So to understand a little bit more about how we could use metabolism in this way, I want to talk a little bit about the Warburg effect in particular. This is probably the most famous metabolic change that is known to occur in cancer and in primary brain tumors in particular. So to take everyone back to biochemistry, here is a cell, and this is the cell membrane. And so there's glucose outside the cell, and as glucose comes into the cell, one of the large junctures is pyruvate. And pyruvate can get processed basically into oxidative phosphorylation in one direction. And in that direction, it's mediated largely through the mitochondria. You have evolution of CO2, in the aqueous cytosol, it really transfers back and forth to bicarbonate. However, uh, glycolysis is also a, a potential route for, for processing of pyruvate and the end result is lactate in glycolysis. And so the Warburg effect is in the absence of any other uh, stressors, including normal blood flow, tumors are known to favor glycolysis. They shift to lactate, they produce more lactate, and they uh, undergo less oxidative phosphorylation. And in this diagram, as you move further to the right, you have more Warburg effect. This preference for glycolysis seems unusual initially. However, there's really a lot of reasons why tumors may benefit. Hydrocarbon backbones and also redox species may be usable in biosynthesis, especially through the pentose phosphate pathway to produce more tumor. In addition, energy production and also really more simpler energy apparatus is less vulnerable to the oxidative damage that occurs in tumors and in normal tissue. The resulting acidic environment is important for many physiologic changes related to tumor, including tumor invasion, excuse me, and also immunosuppression. So immune cells less able to attack the tumor in the acidic environment and also normal tissue less able to survive. It's been linked to tumor aggressiveness already. And so really is a great target to image. So to move forward to how we would image them with those methods and some results we have, as well as current investigations. So first I'd like to talk about the deuterium metabolic imaging and then the Warburg index. So deuterium metabolic imaging, really the credit goes to my colleagues at Yale, Dr. DeFater, Hank DeFater, as well as Dr. Robin DeGraff, who have really done an amazing job in developing this tool. 
we are able to give patients deuterated glucose. So this is heavy water, or sorry, heavy glucose, basically protons with a neutron attached. Patients can drink them and it actually goes into their cells over the course of about an hour. And we can see deuterated lactates evolving in tumor. And we can see the evolution through oxidative phosphorylation of glutamate, and technically it includes glutamate and glutamine signal. And as you can see the shifting more towards glycolysis, you can actually image a really direct biomarker of the Warburg effect. So once again, so you have deuterated lactate over glutamate, really glutamate glutamine is related to glycolysis over oxidative phosphorylation, which is the Warburg effect. So we were able to start with multiple different types of brain tumors. And I'm gonna show you a few today um, to discuss the tumor I mentioned before that medium grade tumor, an anaplastic oligodendroglioma. Here you have a patient, this is a flare, this is post contrast and you can see residual tumor. The patient has two voxels that are shown here in the MR spectroscopic uh, spectrum and so you can see the glucose is measurable in both spectra. And you can see in the map that you can see lots of glutamate and glutamine evolving in the normal brain. So this is really wonderful. This tumor, so the black, sorry, the red voxel showing you this tumor is producing glutamate and glutamine through oxidative phosphorylation, similar to perhaps the normal brain. And really the lactate measurement would be out here. We don't see the lactate in either site. One of the reasons why this tumor may actually have a more favorable character is the IDH mutation, which is famous all over the world, many different cancers, including glioma. And we have one of the world experts in IDH mutant glioma at Yale, which is, who is one of my mentors, Dr. Bindra. Ranjit Bindra um, has really been able to help me understand this better. Isocitrate in uh, IDH wild type uh, pathology, or sorry, physiology, produces alpha ketoglutarate. And with the IDH mutation that occurs in tumors, there's a heterodimer, and the heterodimer produces 2-hydroxybutyrate. This has been called a oncometabolite, which is a metabolite that may actually be involved in the production or the continuation of tumor genesis. Downstream to 2-hydroxybutyrate and IDH mutant pathophysiology is methylation changes, DNA hypermethylation, and particularly MGMT methylation in gliomas, but also histone methylation. So I actually had the privilege of caring for what is a relatively rare patient who is an IDH mutant glioblastoma. And we were able to actually image uh, the tumor with deuterium metabolic imaging. This is prior to the patient having surgery. So this is really a perfect case. And so with this case, we can see here is the recurrent tumor. This is once again, an IDH mutant glioblastoma. You can see the post gadolinium scan is showing you tumor there. This is uh, evidence of bleeding, which is common. And this is evidence of diffusion weighted changes, which is also common. I wanna call your attention to voxels one and three here, which are up here. These are within the tumor. And you can see the maps that are generated by deuterium metabolic imaging are really marvelous. They show that glucose is going everywhere in the brain. They show that glutamate and glutamine is being produced by oxidative phosphorylation as is expected in the normal brain. And it's really a totally different picture over the brain tumor. You can see this is the Warburg index. Lactate over glutamate glutamine is a very large peak over the tumor. And here you have the lactate visible in the spectrum. And you can see that there is a glutamate glutamine peak. It's a little easier to see with uh, voxel one. So I'm gonna call your attention in particular to voxel one, and I'm gonna show you an IDH wild type, a much more common glioblastoma that we were able to image. Call your attention to two voxels in the spectroscopy. So you can see there is two, which is within the tumor, and there's one, which is within normal brain. No lactate in the normal brain, lots of glutamate and glutamine in the normal brain, but lactate and glutamate and glutamine really within the tumor, very little within the tumor, almost noise, but a very large Warburg effect. This is really an N of one experiment, but it is very intriguing to see that there is more lactate and almost no glutamate and glutamine in the IDH wild type glioblastoma compared to much more even uh, presentation in the IDH mutant glioblastoma. So we've developed a theory that we're very excited about that really the Warburg effect may be blunted or 
muted in an IDH mutant pathophysiology such that it displays metabolism more like normal brain where oxidative phosphorylation occurs to a greater extent than in a IDH wild type tumor. So we've heard a lot about today FDG pets. Just to go briefly, the way that we would use this to help us with a clinical tool that might show the Warburg effect right now. Really, the, the deuterium metabolic imaging is wonderful, but really it's preclinical uh, technology. Um, we could actually use potentially FDG PET and FDA approved study. Um, it's phosphorylated by hexokinase as it comes into the cell, but then really it kind of represents glucose demand. And for my purposes, I'm referring to it as the representation of oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation or sort of the call of all energy into the tumor. We are combining that, it's a multimodality test. So the patient also will receive magnetic resonance spectroscopy, this time without a stable isotope measure like the deuterium. And we'll be able to measure lactate, which we can measure in the clinic actually in brain tumors. In the research context, we can also measure 2-hydroxybutyrate, which will be very interesting in the study to correlate the IDH character of the tumor, if you will, and the, the other uh, measures, including the Warburg index. So the Warburg effect being measured with a multimodality image where we have lactate by MR spectroscopy over the standard uptake value with FDG PET. And we are saying that that should be relatively equal, hopefully, to glycolysis over oxidative phosphorylation, which is the Warburg effect, but we're labeling that the Warburg index, because this can be a tool that we could use now in the clinic. So we're looking forward to starting soon as we transform into a normal process of enrolling patients in observational clinical trials. We'll have uh, cohorts of 17 and 17, IDH mutant gliomas and IDH wild type gliomas. And we'll be performing MR spectroscopy imaging uh, with protons, no label, and measure lactate and 2-hydroxybutyrate in all of these patients. And we will also perform FDG PET and, and determine the sort of overall glucose demand, energy demand from the tumor. Hopefully we'll be able to enroll these patients in more technical studies where we'll have really a, a, a research standard of the Warburg effect through things like the deuterium metabolic imaging stable isotope methods at the same time. We all work together and Dr. DeFater is one of my closest collaborators. And we will then follow this cohort of patients to produce our own clinical outcome measures, especially I'm interested in progression-free survival and overall survival, which will be diverse in this group of patients where some patients will have an IDH wild type tumor, more similar to a glioblastoma, as I've shown you here. And some will have an IDH mutant tumor, more similar to these long-term uh, patients that have very slow growing tumors. We will also, through collaborations with Dr. Murat Ganel's laboratory, be able to perform whole genome methylation studies in all of these patients. So we'll have an extraordinarily diverse and deep data set where we'll be able to potentially use preclinical Warburg effect measures to compare to clinical Warburg index measures, compare both of these measures to clinical outcomes, and then also in a vein of precision medicine implications, be able to show exactly how much perhaps 2-hydroxybutyrate is being produced by the IDH mutant pathophysiology, and then what the implications to the methylome and the methylation of the genome is. So future directions, we have actually recently been able to, to image a patient within their treatment. So I've shown you once again, IDH mutant glioblastoma, and I've shown you IDH wild type glioblastoma. They're relatively similar appearing if you're not looking at the spectra per se. It looks like very large Warburg effect, classic aggressive tumor. We had a patient who had a glioblastoma shortly following chemo radiation. And when we imaged this patient, we were unable to detect the Warburg effect. And this is very exciting. We potentially have not only implications to diagnostic and prognostic implications, as I was mentioning before with the Warburg Index uh, clinical study, but now we have the potential to follow the same patient during their course where perhaps there are dynamic changes within the tumor. Perhaps this is just a time when, you, when we caught this tumor and it was less, had less expression of the Warburg effect. 
but perhaps we're able to modify the Warburg effect and perhaps the aggressiveness of the tumor with treatment that we do. And really, if we can find that this is what we're really targeting and not the changes that can be so confusing, for example, with pseudo progression, then that's a very exciting frontier. So we're hopeful with the translational award moving forward that we'll be able to scan some of these patients longitudinally, both before and after chemo radiation, but in addition, along the way, we scan patients in the clinic every two months. And so if we could potentially get metabolic imaging for all of these patients, then it would potentially change our management fundamentally. So I wanna thank uh, lots of people for all of this effort. It's definitely a village doing translational neuro-oncology. This is really my laboratory. Sai is my current research uh, in assistant and I have alumni who are already at Duke and NYU in medical school. I'm ex extremely grateful for the support I've had here through the YCCI Scholar Award. Also my collaborators are a one. I'm grateful to Dr. Fuchs and to the Cancer Center, as well as just a, a multi-institutional collaboration. Dr. Recht is one of my mentors from Stanford. All of these individuals, it's not even a complete list at Yale, really need no introduction, but especially grateful for this talk for contributions from Dr. DeFater and Dr. Rothman. And I wanna thank you very much for all of your attention. And I think this is time for questions. Jack, thank you. And yes, we do actually, it's a great talk and, and we do have time for questions if, if individuals wanna submit that on the chat. So Zach, let me ask you, given the, the, the thrust of your work, um, are there potentially uh, developing on or ongoing uh, targeted approaches that would sort of focus on metabolic pathways coming along that your technology, your assessments would actually be informative for? Or, and or does this potentially offer up new targets? Well, I think that's a great, that's a great question. And, and I think there's uh, a couple ways. So actually IDH mutation targeting has really gone both ways in our field. It has been proposed that IDH mutant pathophysiology should be blocked with an inhibitor and there's current clinical trials um, in that vein. And then there's the exact opposite approach, which is that IDH mutant pathophysiology conveys really a weakness that needs to be targeted and potentially promoted, which is really um, not to, just to paraphrase simply Dr. Bindra's uh, thrust of work. And so th this is actually, uh, we're already interested in potentially uh, performing animal models where we can show the metabolic uh, correlates to these interventions, but we have the potential also for doing so in the clinic. And that's really why I'm, I find the Warburg index as opposed to the uh, preclinical measures to be so exciting. This could be put in as an endpoint in potentially a phase two or phase three study um, very shortly. So hopefully over the next year, I'll be able to, to recruit this, these cohorts and really have some exciting things to share. Great, well, I look forward to it, Zach. So it is the top of the hour and I wanna be sensitive to everyone's time. So I, I wanna thank Zach and Jason for really two outstanding and informative talks about novel approaches to imaging for the CNS. And of course, thank all of you for joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>